In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Welcome, my beloved, to another homily podcast. Today, specifically talking about a subject that is so dear to so many of us. Whether you are a beginner in the Christian life, whether this is the start of something new for you, or whether it has been years, decades maybe even, that you have been a Christian but you've struggled with prayer. The subject that we are going to discuss today is something that is so important to so many of us. And what we are going to be discussing is how is it that we actually begin to build a life of prayer. And more focused today is going to be our conversation about what it means for us to go into that secret place that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, specifically Matthew chapter 6, where he talks on the Sermon of the Mount of the importance of going to that secret place and talking to your Father who is in heaven. So without further ado, Let's go ahead and jump into today's conversation. Now, today's conversation specifically is one that I am hoping that we will be able to have by taking the advice of a very saintly patriarch of the 4th century. We're going to be taking the advice of a saint, and more specifically, St. John Chrysostom. A lot of the commentaries that we're going to be reading today and the things that we're going to be discussing are going to be based on St. John Chrysostom commentary on the Gospel of St. Matthew. So what we're hoping to do today is to try to understand what does it mean for us to go into that secret place? What does it mean for us to be able to build that relationship when no one else is looking, when it's just me and the Lord, and here I am standing before Him and trying to build this relationship with the God whom I love and who I want to be in relationship with. So Let's go ahead and understand where all of this is coming from. We begin by reading the actual passage from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, where the Lord is preaching and telling the people the following, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. For you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Immediately the Lord begins by saying, there are two approaches that you can have when it comes to prayer. You can come to God in a public setting where you want people to focus on you, attribute righteousness and piety to you because they see you pray. But rather, he says, I want you going to that secret place to desire a relationship with God that is private, that is intimate. And I want your relationship of prayer to be one where where you go in secret and meet with God, your Father who is in heaven, who sees you standing there in that secret place, will reward you openly. What can we learn from what it is that the Lord is preaching here? Well, first and foremost, it's so important for us to understand, according to St. John Chrysostom, you have to know who it is that you stand in front of. You have to believe that when you go into that secret place, that you are actually meeting with the Lord, the creator of the universe, the king of all of creation. If you believe that you stand in his presence, then you should also understand that wherever you pray, wherever that secret place is, you should know where it is that you stand. And some people might hear this and think to themselves, what do you mean where? I'm obviously standing in the corner of my bedroom or I have a dedicated prayer room in my home. No. What St. John Christum points to here is he's saying that wherever you bring yourself in the presence of God, you have to acknowledge who it is that you stand with. Listen to what St. John Christum says. He says, when you pray, it is as if you were entering into a palace. Not a palace on earth, but far more awesome. A palace in heaven. When you enter there, you do so with complete attentiveness and fitting respect. For in the house of kings, all turmoil is set aside and silence reigns. Yet here, you are being joined by choirs of angels. You are in communion with archangels and singing with the seraphim, who sing with great awe their spiritual hymns and sacred songs to God, the Lord of all. St. John Chrysostom is trying to inspire you and me to understand that when I stand before my Father in heaven, by entering into His presence, I am joined by all of the heavenly hosts. I now enter into the reality of the kingdom because I am speaking to the King enthroned in heaven. 
And so this idea of understanding who it is that I stand with and how it is that I am participating in the heavenly when I enter into that secret place, this alone should be a significant motivator in my life. To know that if I want to be able to taste the kingdom here and now, if I want to be able to grasp and touch the kingdom here in my life, then a big part of this is to enter into that secret place and to desire to stand before my Father who is in heaven. Again, there also has to be this acknowledgement, not only of where you stand and who you stand before, but also to remember the promises that he makes to us. Because how often are we tempted to not want to stand, to be inconsistent, to think to ourselves, I'm too tired, the day has been so long and so tiresome, and to think to myself, tomorrow I'll pray. In the morning I'll say I'll pray this evening, in the evening I'll say I'll pray tomorrow morning, and it just becomes a continuous cycle of me pushing it off. And when the devil tempts us in this way, it's because he wants to steal away from us the opportunities of receiving the graces and the gifts that the Lord has promised us. Now, what are the promises of the Lord? St. John Chrysostom says, remember, acknowledge the promises of God so you can be motivated. What does he say? For your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. And here he's referencing the passage of Matthew chapter 6 that we just read. He did not merely say that he would give it to you, but reward you as if he himself had made a pledge to you and so honored you with great honor. Because God himself is hidden, your prayer should be hidden. St. John is telling you and me, when we acknowledge that the Lord is faithful, when the Lord is not in any way a deceiver, he is never dishonest. If he says he will reward us, then we know that the reward will be given. The reward of comfort, of peace, of joy, of the acknowledgement of recognizing that I am in relationship with the one who is my savior, my king, my creator. All of these are rewarded to me. I become a person who even publicly, people see grace poured into me. They recognize that I carry the peace of God that according to St. Paul in the book of Philippians, surpasses all understanding. And he says here so beautifully, because God himself is hidden, your prayer should be hidden. Because the Lord waits for us in that secret place, and that is where we ought to meet him. But his reward for us, and he is faithful. He is faithful in keeping his promises. He will reward us so that all of the graces poured out on us are reflected openly. Again, remember that the whole purpose behind prayer is that the human beings stand before God, stretch out his hands, and reach out to God and tell him, Lord, hear my cry. This is why you'll remember that if ever you've participated in an Orthodox liturgical prayer, incense is constantly used. And when you walk into a church setting and you see the incense floating, you see this so often, if you walk into a church after the liturgical prayers have already begun, it seems as if the incense begins to rise to the top of the church, but at some point it stands perfectly still. It fills the air. You can almost see it. If you have big windows and sunshine is pouring into the church, you begin to see the incense almost floating around you. As you walk into the church, you walk through the incense, the beautiful cloud of that aroma that is so pleasing to the heart, to the soul. All of these beautiful indications that are around us remind us of how it is that we enter into a space of prayer. We are walking through a cloud of prayer, if you wish. And constantly the liturgical prayers of the Orthodox Church remind us that the incense itself is a, is a, is a symbol of how it is that the prayers themselves are raised up to the Lord. Where did we get this? There's a beautiful passage in the book of Tobit where we reference this very thing regarding prayer and incense. And so what does it say? So now when you and Sarah prayed, and here it's the Archangel uh, Gabriel, uh, the Archangel Raphael, who is speaking to Tobit. He says, so now when you and Sarah prayed, it was I who brought and read the record of your prayer before the glory of the Lord, we believe that as we pray in the church, our prayers are raised up and presented before the Lord the same way that you will see the cloud of incense being offered. So also we believe that our prayers, the Lord receives them. He receives them and despite me speaking them in the here and now in that secret place in my closet, in my bedroom, those prayers are brought up before God and he is willing to receive them. He is eager to hear the voice of his children who cry out to him and who ask for the very thing that they need to know him 
and to be righteous in him. And here this is where St. John Chrysostom says, your prayer can't just be empty. Your prayer can't just be one that is prayed for the sake of you praying and simply, you know, put it off as if it was a task. No. He says your intention matters. The intention of you wanting to stand before the Lord when no one is looking is of extreme importance. Here I am reminded of how difficult that pandemic period of COVID was on so many of us. So many of us were used to be able to pray, but in a communal setting. As long as we can gather all together at church for liturgy, as long as we can gather all together for midnight praises, as long as we can come to the youth meetings, the Bible studies, then there was no problem for all of us to stand together and pray. But suddenly when we found ourselves during this pandemic locked up all by ourselves at home, so many of us called our spiritual guides and talked about how it is it was so difficult for us to pray even while at home alone. And interestingly, what we've discovered is that we're really good at communal prayer. Many of us have not yet developed the inclination to desire to go to that secret place and stand before the Lord when no one else is around me, when it's just me and Him. I'm encouraged by my brothers and sisters in the communal setting of the church, and this is an important aspect of why the church prays together as one body. But there is also a need for me to have intimacy with the Lord. And so intention of wanting to stand before Him, the intention of doing it when no one is looking, the intention of not having any reward other than my encounter with Him is of extreme importance. What does St. John say? He says, while pretending to pray to God, the hypocrites are looking around for human praise. It's as if they have like <laughs> the side eye open in order for them to check to see, you know, who's paying attention, who's noted that I am praying righteously. While pretending to pray to God, the hypocrites are looking around for human praise. One who is earnestly offering a supplication looks exclusively to the one who has the power to grant the request and lets all other claims recede. But if you leave behind the one you are petitioning and immediately go wandering about looking everywhere for others' approval, you will depart with empty hands. God forbid that this should be what we experience. God forbid that we should find ourselves in a situation where I come to God desiring to receive from Him, but instead my posture changes and I begin to look elsewhere. And instead of looking into the eyes of the one that I have come to petition, the one that I have come to be in relationship with, if I'm distracted by others, then I leave and my hands are empty. Why? Because my posture wasn't directed towards him. My intention was never towards him, but rather towards those who I want to observe me, who I want to note that I am holy, I am righteous, I am pious. God forbid that this should be our intention. You see, this can't happen if we pray in that secret place. If we begin to pray by recognizing the importance of having a prayer corner in my bedroom, a dedicated prayer space in my home, even a closet. But there's got to be somewhere where I go to God and it's only Him and I in those moments. It's only me and Him, intimate with one another. No one else sees us. It's one-on-one -on -one time, just between me and my Lord. Again, St. John, he talks about the importance of us running after Him, pursuing Him. And what is the reward that we receive when we pursue the Lord? Well, listen to what St. John says. He says, the hypocrite's reward comes from those from whom they themselves most desire to get it. Which means what? If you're constantly focused on the public and how the public is going to perceive you, then you'll get your reward. People will tell you you're righteous. People will give you a good word. People will encourage you and say, you look like a holy guy or a holy girl. Congratulations. You got your reward from them. But then he says, God does not desire this. For God preferred to bestow upon humanity the grace that comes only from himself. Those who seek the reward from people cannot receive another reward from the one for whom they have sought nothing. You see, the intention of the heart here is of extreme importance. You didn't intend to receive reward from God because your intention and your motivation was the reward from others and that's what you'll get. Basically, what this means is what? If I'm a beggar, and my hand is stretched out to person A, then it's person A who is going to give me. That's where I'm going to receive from. If I really desire to receive from person B, then my entire person should have been pointed towards person B. In this very specific situation, what does St. John say? He says, those who seek the reward from people cannot receive another reward from the one from whom they sought nothing. If you weren't going to God to begin with, 
you cannot receive from God. And that's not because the Lord will deprive you. It's because you weren't there. You didn't show up to receive from Him. And so the encouragement that we should have is when remembering that as we begin this process of desiring to have a relationship of prayer with the Lord, then our intention should be towards Him. Again, when no one is looking, that secret place. And the Lord was so faithful in telling us, your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So we ought not be those who only pray communally. And by the way, just to be clear, this is not me suggesting that we shouldn't pray together at church. Of course not. That is of extreme importance. The reward of praying together as one body liturgically in the church is such an incredible, um, it, it's like fuel that energizes us to be able to recognize the importance of coming together as one body. The same way that the Holy Spirit descended on the apostles themselves when they were gathered together praying. But that doesn't mean that the apostles didn't have personal relationship with the Lord. Of course they prayed by themselves. They came together at times, but they also had personal and intimate relationship as they themselves went into that secret place that the Lord Jesus had taught them about. Again, remember this importance of secret places. And secret places oftentimes are in those deepest and most intimate places and sometimes those difficult places to be in. Let me give you imagery for you to remember what it is that I'm speaking about. I want you to think of that furnace and how it is that the three holy youth, they didn't come into the presence of God. They didn't have God standing among them outside of the furnace. It was when they entered into the furnace, into the fire, that a fourth appeared among them. Remember the belly of the beast and how it is that Jonah, the Lord didn't come to him when he was on the boat. He didn't come to him in the storm when he was trying to flee from Nineveh. The Lord came to him in the belly of the beast, and that's where he saved him. Remember the lions then. You see, Daniel didn't find himself suddenly surrounded by God's grace and protection outside of the den. It's when he entered into the den. So if you find it difficult, if you find it almost a struggle to stand before the Lord alone, know that this, this is where you meet him. Remember even our Lord Jesus Christ. And how it is that he goes just a little bit further away from his own beloved disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. And how it is that he steps away to be alone with his father. He sets for us the model of how it is that we have to pursue this one-on-one, -on -one, this intimacy, this desire to be alone with God. The same way that in any normal relationship, a man and a woman who truly love each other, yes, there are times where together as a couple, they want to be surrounded by others. And that's wonderful. But there are other times where they want to be alone, where they desire only the attention of the person whom they love so much, the person that they are in relationship with, one-on-one, -on -one, un, um, <laughs> like a, an attention that is not distracted by anything or anyone else. I want your undivided attention, the Lord says. So come to me so that we can be alone. This is the message that we're trying to receive from the gospel. And this aloneness is so beautifully reflected in the lives of so many of the saints. Our Holy Virgin Mother is such a beautiful example of this. We hear virtually nothing from her, the entire gospel. We hear her speak when the Archangel Gabriel appears to her. We hear her speak as she meets and encounters Elizabeth and the babe that is in her womb is, is recognized as the Savior. We hear her speak when her son, at 12 years old, gets lost in Jerusalem and she finds him in the temple. But other than this, everything about her is secret. Everything about her is intimacy with the Lord. St. Luke says in his gospel that she kept all of these things in her heart and it was in her heart that she had relationship with the Lord in a very secret place. Again, we have the example of St. Anthony the Great, the greatest saint. Obviously, I'm biased, but I think he's the greatest saint. St. Anthony, who he hears the gospel say, if you desire to be perfect, come after me, carry your cross, follow me, give everything to the poor, deny yourself. He says, Amen. He runs after the Lord. For a period, he lives in a community of ascetics. He learns everything from them. And then he says, what? 
All I want is him and nothing but him. Undivided attention between me and my savior, me and the lover of my soul. And so he does this and he runs into a desert and is alone. We have a beautiful example of the great ascetic, the bride of Christ, St. Mary of Egypt, who as soon as she repents and she tastes the grace and the love and the mercy of God, what does she do? She spends over 40 years alone in the desert, not seeing the face of another human being until the Lord sends her the priest, St. Susima. But other than that, all she desired was to be alone again with the lover of her soul and her Savior. The Lord is telling you and me, I desire intimate encounter with you. He says, exactly as he expresses in the book of Song of Songs, he says, it is the voice of the beloved. He knocks saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. When the Shulamite in Song of Songs expresses this, what is she saying? My beloved now, I hear his voice on the other side of the door, knocking and saying what? Open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. Please receive this image, this image of the Lord waiting for you in that secret place, knocking and hoping that you would go and meet him in that secret place, as he says, open for me. And then he gives you the most precious title, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. That is the expression of the heart of God towards you personally. It is up to us to be able to respond and to meet him in that secret place. Three pieces of advice from the great and holy saint, St. John Chrysostom. Number one, how to pray. In all simplicity, he says, don't overcomplicate it. He says he did not ask us to compose a prayer of 10,000 phrases and so come to him and merely repeat it. He warned against those who think that they shall be heard for their eloquence. If you're intimidated when you hear other people pray and you think they use big fancy words and they have greater grammar when it comes to a prayer, don't be intimidated by this. There is no reason to compare yourself to them. Come to the Lord in all mercy. It, it's beautiful. Saint Macarius the Great, he says, sometimes the greatest prayer is for us to come before the Lord and to say what? Lord, you know all things. So Lord, have mercy. When he says, just come to the Lord and say, Lord, you know all things. Please be merciful. Then this in and of itself is a beautiful prayer of the heart. Learn from the tax collector who in his moment of extreme repentance says what? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And just go and pour out your heart to the one whom you love. Go and tell him how it is that you feel. Be as informal as you need to be. But in all simplicity, go and spend that time with your beloved. The second piece of advice is, he says, pray with faith. He says, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. But if, you already, if he already knows what we need, why do we pray? And he's asking a very logical question. Many of us will say, is the purpose of prayer for me to inform God? I thought he already knew everything. So St. John says, if he already knows what we need, then why do we pray? So he answers very beautifully and very directly, not to inform God or to instruct him, but to beseech him closely, to be made intimate with him by continuance and supplication, to be humbled, to be reminded of our sins. The benefit of prayer is not that I inform God. The benefit is for me to be in relationship with God. I want to give you an example of this. I want you to imagine that I come home after a very long day. And after I come home after a very long day, I'm sitting in the living room and my kitchen is not too far away, but I hear my wife and my kids standing in the kitchen and they're cooking something together. So I hear them clanking and using all of the utensils and cracking eggs and using flour. And I know I can hear their conversation because it's only a few footsteps away, the living room from the kitchen. And I hear them talk about how it is that they're making cookies. And so I know that they're using all these different kinds of ingredients. I can hear my wife tell my kids, okay, be careful, put the tray in the oven. I hear all of these things happen. But then my daughter, imagine if she was a little bit younger, imagine that she's only six, seven years old and she runs in and she sees me in the living room after she's waiting for the cookies to bake. And she runs in and she says, daddy, 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 let me tell you what it is that we're doing in the kitchen. As a good father, what am I supposed to do? Should I stop her? Should I say, no, there's no need. I heard everything. I know everything. You don't need to inform me because to inform me would be a waste of time seeing as how as I already know exactly what you're doing. That would be ridiculous. 
<laughs> she should still be given the opportunity to express to me what it is that she wants to share for the sake of her loving me and for the sake of me having the opportunity to show her love. It has nothing to do with informing me at this point. As a good father, I want to give her the opportunity to express to me what I already know, but for the sake of the relationship, for the sake of her loving the idea of coming to me, sharing with me, speaking to me, and in the process receiving from me love and grace and compassion and so on and so forth. The Lord does the same thing. Regardless of whether or not He knows, He desires for us to come to Him. The third piece of advice is the following. Pray persistently, He says. But if you do not receive immediately, do not despair in this way. For it is because of this that Jesus said, knock, to show that even if he does not open the door immediately, we should remain at the door knocking. When the Lord encourages us, find, seek, knock, the knocking is the indication of what? I'm not only going to ask once and leave it at that and say, I already asked for it. It's up to him to decide. No. He wants us to keep coming back to him. Be persistent, he says. Why do you think the number one most favorite prayer of the church during the liturgical prayer is what? Lord have mercy. How many times do we repeat Kigyalaison? How many times do we repeat Lord have mercy? Over and over again we say it. Not because the Lord forgot that we just asked it 10 seconds ago, but rather because we have learned to be persistent with the Lord. Even in his gospel messages, when he talks about the persistence of the woman who knocks at the door, of that neighbor who finally receives what it is that they have been asking for because of their persistence. And we also should be persistent with God. He wants us to demonstrate to what extent that we trust in his faithfulness, that he will respond in due time. Ultimately, my beloved, the most important piece of everything that we are discussing right now. It's for us to come to the realization the Lord really does desire for us to come to Him in that secret place, for us to go to Him in simplicity, for us to go to Him in faith, knowing that He will respond, for us to be persistent in our prayer. We know that He will hear our prayer. We know that He waits for us, that He knocks and He says, here I am knocking at your door. You who are my love, my bride, my dove, my perfect one. The Lord waits for you and me and He says, if you have not yet begun to pray, then let's start now. Let's begin. Go find that secret place. Set for yourself up a corner in your room, a specific room that you could dedicate, even your closet. But come to me in that secret place. And my Father who sees in secret will reward you openly, the Lord says. My beloved, it is always such a blessing for us to spend this time together, for us to be able to share with each other and I pray that this message was well received by you and if it can benefit you or anyone else we encourage you to please share it with those who might need to hear it so that they also may join the Lord in that secret place and begin their relationship and begin to pray. May the Lord bless you and please remember all of us in your prayers. To God be all glory now and forever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.